Maxim will shine. I want a gold one that's silver lined. I've got a mansion just over the hills off in that bright land. Because in Jesus Christ we have the the hope of heaven, the, the actually the secure hope of heaven. Because you know, as long as you're holding His hand, His grip is tighter than yours, and He's not going to let go of you unless you let go of Him. Isn't that good news? So let's worship Him with with uh, optimism, joy, and peace, and encourage one another. Because you're in the right place at the right time today. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we thank you for that mansion over a hilltop that we have. We thank you for the joy of our salvation. We thank you that it was that it was purchased at an awful price, the blood of your dear son, and that you were willing to offer that sacrifice. We don't understand that kind of love, but it certainly brings into focus the awfulness of our sin and the awesomeness of your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, the song is number 92. <clears throat> Number 92, glorious things of thee are spoken. There it is. Mm, glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion city of our God, he whose words and not be broken. Oh, Thank you. 
place and let ground appear and it was so God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas and God saw that it was good then God said let the land produce vegetation seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds and it was so the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Good morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may obey, be fruitful, and multiply. Fill us with your spirit, fill us with your joy. Teach us, Father, to be cheerful givers of our time, of our treasure, of our hearts. And Lord, increase our influence as we increase our obedience to you. Remake us into a body filled with disciples making disciples. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is alive and well and working in the world today, amen? amen? And it has been thus from the beginning. 
He's always been working. I remember years ago, maybe 60 years ago, certainly more than 50 years ago, uh, riding in our car. Can't remember which car it was. Uh, was it the 64 Ford Galaxy that my dad wrecked in Cincinnati? Was it the um, 67 Dodge Coronet? I know I'm dating myself. You people don't even know what those cars are, do you? So, well, some of you are nodding, you know. Uh, or was it the... Um, 1970 Chevy uh, station wagon, you know, the one with the disappearing tailgates, you know, you, you, they, 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 dis, they didn't disappear because I had to sit in the back seat where the tailgate was and I had no headroom. Um, I think it was that car, so it would have been more than 50 years ago. Mom was driving, dad was reading to us, and he was, um, it was an article from some scientific journal describing the symbiotic relationship between bees and flowers. You probably know all about it, but bees could not survive without the flowers, and flowers could not survive without the bees, because as the bees go from flower to flower, uh, uh, extracting the nectar that they need to, to survive, they're also going from flower to flower with the pollen all over their bodies because they're down there with all of that pollen and they're taking the pollen from flower to flower without which the flower could not produce a seed and without which there would not be another generation of flowers. So plant life and animal life are connected, especially with this illustration of the the bees and the flowers. Entire species of plants would die without pollination And pollination without the pollinator, in this case, the bee, would not take place. Where would we be without plants? You may not even like plants. You may not be among those that the Lord brought brought forth vegetarians as a... (laughs) I'm sorry, I had to tease. (laughs) You know, we're not among those that are vegetarians, right? I mean, some of us are, some of us aren't. But... God brought forth vegetation, and without the vegetation, what do the animals eat? So if you're just a complete carnivore, you're still dependent on the plants, are we not? Where would we be without plants? Where would we be without honey? What a great nutrient that is. So you see, nature is interdependent. So many things linked together without which we could not survive. So many things that if one really considers it, it demands that we conclude that this world must have been designed for us. And that kind of design demands some kind of designer, some kind of intelligence far beyond our own. I know I've mentioned this before, but the thought continues to thrill me. Just think about oxygen for a minute. We can't see it, but without it, we die, right? Without it, we suffocate. We must have oxygen, and plants must have carbon dioxide. Well, you understand what happens there. What, is it, what did you learn in school? The plants breathe in the carbon dioxide that we exhale, and the plants breathe out the oxygen that we inhale. So we have this system between plants and animals that were it not there, we would have either run out of carbon dioxide and the plants would have all died and we would have followed, or we would have run out of oxygen and we all would have suffocated and the plants would have died because we were, were not there to supply the oxygen for them. This interdependent perpetual motion machine that God set in motion a long time ago to sustain life on this earth. Pretty cool system. Ain't that a happy accident? It is no accident. It is designed. Beloved, nature is replete with examples of these symbiotic, interdependent relationships, relationships which, if they did not exist, we could not exist. We couldn't have survived. Consider the clownfish and its codependent relationship with the sea anemone. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is that correct, sea anemone? Okay, the sea anemone is an animal. I didn't know that. I thought it was a plant, but it's an animal despite its plant-like appearance. It eats fish and other small creatures, 
many of them not any larger than the clownfish. So why does the sea anemone, why does the sea anemone not consume the clownfish that lives in its tentacles? Well, scientists aren't really sure exactly how this mechanism works, but, but for, some, for some reason the clownfish is immune to the venom from the sea anemone. And so they can live quite nicely among the tentacles, sheltered and protected from other predators because they're not going to brave the tentacles of the sea anemone to go get a clownfish. And, and so he can hide in that creature's tentacles, safe from other predators. And the, the clownfish also finds a lot of his food right there among the tentacles because those tentacles die sometimes. And when they die, that's food for the, for the clownfish. In return for making his home among the sea and enemy's tentacles, the clownfish will often chase predators away from the sea and enemy. So somebody, some, some predators coming after the sea and enemy, the, the, the clownfish like a chihuahua. We had a chihuahua once. <laughs> the most vile creature that God ever allowed <laughs> to be born. Bit me hundreds of times. I hated that dog, and she lived a long time. But I remember one day watching that, that Tina was her name, very, very friendly name, Tina. Yeah, Tina, the whatever. Um, huge dogs would come in the backyard, and Tina would just chase them right out, okay? Clownfish would chase away the predators. In addition... The sea anemone receives nutrition from the clown. So, so the, the clownfish receives nutrition from the dead things in the, in the sea anemone, like those tentacles that break off and other, and other parts that die. And the clownfish supplies food for the sea anemone with its, well, uh, feces. A true symbiotic relationship. Nature, cooperating with nature to the benefit of each species. Who hammered out that agreement? Who negotiated that? Yeah, yeah. This is a honey glide. I'd never heard of such an animal until recently. The key food source for the honey guide is the eggs, larva, and beeswax found in beehives. Now that's quite a feast, is it not? The honey guide is very resourceful in how he obtains these nutrients. He gets the humans to do a lot of the hard work for him. Listen to this explanation from an article on the M Museum of Natural History's website. The wild honey guides recruit people with a demanding call indicating that they have found a bee nest. The honey-hunting humans reply with calls passed down through generations and follow the bird. When they reach the nest, the humans subdue the bees with smoke, break into the nest, and help themselves to the, to the honey contained within. The Hazda people of Tanzania are one group, group known to work with honey guides. It has been estimated that up to 10% of their diet is acquired with the help of the birds. This is keeping people alive in, in, in desert, in, in, in wilderness areas. With the bees dispatched and the humans satisfi satisfied, the honey guides are left to dine on the beeswax, eggs, and larvae left behind. Who hammered out that agreement? Was there a conference between the birds and the humans? How did that work out? I don't know. Here's the point of all of this. We live in a world where there are countless symbiotic relationships where one organism could not survive without, without another in some mutually beneficial arrangement that doesn't appear to have been negotiated between the two species. It's amazing. For a final example, and I don't have a picture of this, do you know, you do know that your body consists of trillions of cells, most of them human, but there are also trillions of cells in your body right now, don't freak out, that are not human. There are, what's the proper, trillions of non-human cells in your body. 
that alien. <laughs> oh, goodness, Barry, don't trigger me. I started to do something, started to say something that probably wouldn't have been appropriate. Now, <laughs> trillions of beneficial, bac beneficial bacteria in our bodies helping us live, helping us survive, helping us process the food that we eat, without which we couldn't process the food that we eat and without which we wouldn't live as long. If we didn't have this beneficial bacteria in our bodies, we wouldn't survive as long. What an arrangement. Who hammered that out? Who worked that out? Who caused that to happen? The naturalists would claim that these, arrangement evolved, these arrangements evolved over billions of years, chaos evolving into order, which frankly goes against the laws of thermodynamics, which says that things are evolving from order into chaos. Think of a human body. It's very organized, animated, and efficient before it dies, isn't it? But what happens once the human body dies? Breakdown, decay, order descending into chaos. That's the way the universe operates. But the, but the naturalists would have us believe that it's just the opposite. Yet we who are willing to believe in a power greater than what we see, a power able to organize and plan the universe for the benefit of we who live in the universe, see these many relationships as strong evidence for a universe that was designed by an intelligence far greater than ours, by an intelligence that we call the Almighty. I'm no scientist. I graduated with a, from Harding University with a major in history and a minor in Bible, business, and Spanish. Took a few hours at what is now called the Harding Graduate School of Theology. My education has been mostly bookish my entire life. That's been my education. And my work through most of my life has been with people in a non-scientific way teaching, preaching, counseling, helping, that sort of thing. So others have far more scientific knowledge than I do. But I'd like to think that God has given me and us a measure of, of common sense, that we can look at things and see them for what they are. And I don't believe it takes a whole lot of scientific knowledge or that many initials after our name to take a look at what is going on in nature and see the hand of God in it. When I look at these amazing relationships that prevail throughout nature, relationships, some inside our own bodies, relationships that accrue to our benefit, I'm going to fall down and worship. How great is our God? And I'm drawn back to the Bible verse that was read in the beginning. Let's read the passage once more. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. See, right there on the third day of creation, our Father set in motion so many things that give us benefit even today. The vegetables we eat, the fruit we eat, the means whereby those vegetables propagate their species, the oxygen they give us to breathe. All of this our Father did for us. And there was not a gap of billions of years between the rising up of plant life and the rising up of animal life because it couldn't have, neither could have survived had it been that way. The oxygen would have been used. The oxygen would have been used up. The carbon dioxide would have been used up, and the plant life would have died, and, and the oxygen would have gone with it, and our food supply would have gone with it. It couldn't have been a very long gap between the rising up of one type of life and the rising up of its complementary 
other kind of life. So on the sixth day, three days later, God did something amazing. He made us. He made the animals. And without the animals doing what the animals do, plant life could, have, could not have survived. And without the plants doing what the plants do, plant life, animal life could not have survived. We are interdependent. We depend one on the other for our survival in the flesh. Without plants doing what plants do, animal life would have eventually died, died out. Without each part of creation, plant and animal, the whole thing would have collapsed. We would not be here had we not come about at the same time. It wouldn't have worked. But God set up an amazing symbiotic system here on this earth. I've only scratched the surface of it. But he set up this amazing symbiotic system here on this planet where the animals and the plants depend on each other for the continuance of the other. And they do so not even knowing that they're dependent on one another. It wasn't negotiated. Once again, God set it in motion. And we've just lived in it and benefited from it for all these thousands of years that there's been human life on the planet. God, they, we are truly interdependent. God set it up and God sustains it. The naturalist would say something different. The naturalist would say that this system evolved over billions of years, to which I would say that's not even enough time. Not enough time for that to have happened because over those billions of years, they would have died. You know, one of us would have died out, one or the other. The naturalist would say that because uh, the naturalist would say that we have it in our power to destroy what God has put together. Therefore, we better behave right with our trash and we better behave right with this and behave right with that or else we're just going to cause the whole thing to collapse. Beloved, if God set it in motion, he knows how to bring it to an end. Am I contending that we should just take no regard for cleanliness and taking the trash out and... And things like that. No, I'm not saying that. I remember years ago uh, when I was a kid at, at, at Harding, our biology teacher talking about how he had waved his hands at the people that were building a dam nearby, saying that if they built it the way they built it, they were going to destroy the habitat for the, for the trout that naturally, for the, for the bass that naturally swam in that stream. They didn't listen to them, and guess what happened? The bass in that stream died, and, they had, and the water was so cold, they had to set up trout hatcheries, trout hatcheries below the dam so that there would be some fish in the sea. So it's a great, tra it's a great trout fishing stream now if they put the trout in it. So, yeah, there are negative consequences when we, don't, when we ignore what nature is telling us. But God put this earth together. And he's going to bring it to an end according, according to his timetable and according to his schedule. We're not powerful enough to make that happen. He, we will continue in this system until he brings it to an end. And we will continue to reap the benefits of the system that he set in motion until, until he brings it to an end. Oh, how he loves us. Now, why am I talking about this today? A couple of weeks I've been talking about this. Well, I believe it's important in these days when the scripture is being ridiculed and uh, mocked for us to understand that what we believe is eminently reasonable. We believe in the resurrection by faith. We believe in the creation by faith, but it is not blind faith. There is ample evidence for the resurrection, and there is ample evidence for a universe that came to be because of the knowledge and wisdom of the one who created the universe. We follow, we follow God, and he is nature's God, and he reveals himself in nature. 
And, to, and today, I hope you take home the fact that he reveals his love to us in nature. Let's talk to our Father in heaven about it. Lord, we thank you for the many evidences that you give us every day of your power, of your love, of your care, of your infinite wisdom. We thank you, Father, for this earth that you've given to us to have dominion over. And we pray, Father, that you would teach us to exercise that dominion well because we know we'll be accountable to you for how we exercise the dominion that you have given us. We thank you, Father, for your love, for your provision, and we pray that we would always be ever aware that you have done it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a final interdependent relationship I'd like to talk to you about in these next few minutes. And that is the church. We depend on one another here, do we not? We look out for each other here, do we not? And if we don't, should we? The church is the family of God. And if you are part of the family of God, you have fellowship, you have the spirit, you have friends, you have people that have your back. And above all, you have a home in heaven to go to that we sang about at the beginning, a mansion over the hilltop. If you're not part of that arrangement, I highly recommend it. And more than that, Jesus, who died for you, commands it. He commands that all would come to repentance. He's waited a long time for you. Do you love him? Do you want to be part of him? Do you want to go to that mansion over a hilltop? Do you want to be part of the family of God now? It's my prayer that that is what you want. And if you as a member have lost touch of that relationship and you've wandered away, maybe it's time to, to uh, come back home. Whatever your need is, I pray that you would come to the family of God, come to the cross of Christ while we stand and sing. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot count, that all may cleanse in me, in thy once open fount. I bring them, Savior, all to thee, the burden is too great for me, the
I said something this morning while I was preaching that I feel like I need to apologize. And I said it in public. I said it for the whole congregation. George, you probably don't care, but I teased you a little bit. And if it did hurt you, I'm sorry. I've got a big mouth, and sometimes I just start having a little bit too much fun. If there was a fence. Okay, hold on. I'll let you set that straight in front of you. Okay. Our minds for the Lord's table was uh, 335 in memory of the Savior's love. <clears throat> we three, five. Morning, everyone. Morning. Have a few minutes here to uh, remember our Lord's sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection, and uh, celebrate that together. I got a reading here from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, that's, that, that's important for us to think about. Jesus is talking. Uh, with his disciples and others, and and uh, he makes a statement. Uh, for as often, starting in verse twenty six, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and then so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and drinks judgment on him and, and drinks judgment on himself. So Paul was addressing some issues in the church there at Corinth and uh, where they were apparently mistreating each other. They uh, <coughs> Many commentators will say that, or point out that the Lord's Supper there was more like a meal that they had with each other, and the wealthy were not sharing with the poor, and even to the point where you know many were getting uh, intoxicated, drunk, and uh, totally dishonoring the uh, the Lord's Supper. But one of the issues there mainly was they weren't treating each other as equals in, in God's sight. There was a lot of disunity and malice that was going on there. And he was pointing out to them that they need to fix that because if they don't, they're, they're actually drinking and eating to their own condemnation. So, you know, when we take the Lord's Supper and we share it with each other here as a body, Hopefully, you know, our hearts are that we're at peace with each other. 
and that there's no strife among us, and, and we see each other as brothers and sisters equally in God's sight. And uh, for those who don't believe, I, I guess you can extrapolate that out as to why would you take the Lord's Supper? Because, again, you're admitting that Jesus is the Savior who died and uh, for our sins. And if you're a non-believer, it just doesn't make sense, does it, to celebrate something you don't even believe in? And understanding that by doing that, if you're bringing uh, admitting condemnation at the end of your life if you don't if you don't accept Jesus and follow him so it's just some thoughts to just kind of center us today that uh, we need to be at peace with each other if we have issues or we have ought against a brother or sister you know we read in other places we ne need to go make that right but for this morning and for this moment you know I pray that we're all here in harmony and we're here uh, at peace with each other and can share and can share this together and remember our Lord and what he did for us. Let's, let's pray together and uh, give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and what he did for us. We thank you that we have this uh, time every week to focus, to, to uh, remember what it is that we're about and uh, what it is that our hope is for our, our eternity. We thank you for this bread that, uh, that we're going to share that's going to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Shall we pray? Almighty God, we continue our prayer this morning in this memorial feast. And at this time, we remember the precious blood of your only begotten Son, our Savior. The blood that was shed for the remission of sins. The blood that was shed to purchase the church and the blood that was shed to be of the new covenant. Father, help us always to walk with thee, to try to be more like Jesus every day, to share our faith with others, but most of all, 
to never outlive our love for you and our Savior. Bless us as we partake of the fruit of the vine, which to us represents the precious blood of your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment uh, while we're here all assembled for those that have laid aside an offering uh, to give to, to our Lord. Uh, we're going to come around and, uh, and collect that now. Okay. Please bow. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, we give because, because we know what has been given to us something we could have never, ever purchased ourselves. And we ask you to help us and give us the spirit of grace that you have given us yourself. If we do not have money, help us to give freely of our time or in any other area that we're able to. We have been given a very good example through the early church, saints, and Jesus himself of how we are to conduct our lives. And we just thank you so much for the provision that you have given us. There's nothing, there's nothing that we need in this world more than the grace that you've shown us. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for everything, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, the creator of everything that we see, the physical world that we live in, and the creator of the spiritual world that is battling for each and every one of our souls here. We love you, Father, and we're grateful for this time that we can refresh our spirits in this world that we live in that is dark and that is fallen. But let us take heart because your son has overcome this world. And that's all we need to know. I am grateful, Father, for the heart that beats in my chest that you have created. It's amazing if we just take a moment and realize how wonderful our human bodies are. Um, such balance that we don't even need to think about. We just go about our day. And the only thing that you really want from us is our love. And you give us a choice to do that. You don't require it. You just want it from us, Father. The choice that we have to follow you and to obey you and the rewards that we will be given go far beyond anything that we can imagine. So Father, strengthen us. Let us not fear. Let us not worry and let us not to be concerned about what is going on in this world and help us to keep our focus up to you and your son. Bless us, Father, as we depart this place. Help us to be the light in this dark world. Help us to share your son's love because there is so much spiritual blindness. Help us be the ones that bring people to the light. It's in Jesus' name that I do pray this morning. Amen.